Hey there, boys and girls. Welcome to another edition of the Business of Sports with Andrew Brent. I'm Andrew Brent. I hope you are enjoying this podcast. Try to make it a unique insights and perspective that hopefully you don't hear anywhere else on the interwebs or the podcast world. We're produced by Jack Connell, our musical producer, Sam Brandt, my son. That music you hear is from him, Boy Blue Tunes on Spotify. And of course, we are presented as always by DraftKings. Haven't done a rants in a few weeks, so here I go. I'm gonna talk a lot about the, I know I've been writing about, I've been talking about, I've been starting a, a cottage industry on it with Twitter and social media. It's about the Jets Packers impending trade of Aaron Rodgers. I'm gonna get into it here because I've gotten into it in my Sports Illustrated article, obviously on Twitter, obviously fighting off some Jets fans that feel differently and some even some media voices that feel differently. But I'll tell you why I feel the Packers have the upper hand in these negotiations, and I'll get into all that. First, I want to go through a couple other Brant's rants before we get to that. And let's keep it. Well, before we get to the NFL, let's just give a word on March Madness. I know this is technically the second year, but it really is the first time, at least I'm noticing big time, that this is the first, now maybe the second time that we've had March Madness with athletes able to profit off their name, image, likeness. We're in a different world right now. We're in the Wild West of the NIO revolution. So I watch the games, March Madness, with a different eye towards it right now. One thing is sort of looking at who's going to be the stars that come out of this, what kind of profitability they're going to have, name, image, likeness. The kid on uh, St. Peter's last year, I'm sure that has already happened. You see the coaches already ascending, the fairly Dickinson coach already ascending to Iona, where Rick Pitino left for St. John's. But it is a different world. And, you know, the business of college sports is big business, especially right now. At the end of the day, everyone's watching and they're filling out the brackets and they're having so much fun with it. And we don't think about the billions of dollars it's making on the backs of what has been free labor largely still free labor, these guys are able to monetize and monetize maybe off of this month, but largely free labor. And I think with NIL, I just did a panel at Wharton University of Pennsylvania even earlier today. What we have to understand about NIL is so much focus seems to be on the outliers, the big deals for college quarterbacks, the big deals for the superstar uh, basketball players going to the NBA. But really, most of NIL are small deals. They're shout outs on Instagram. They're a little uh, couple hundred dollars, couple thousand dollars. And let's be real about college sports. I'm at Villanova. You know, we have 24 sports. Only one, one makes money. So in terms of, well, there's unlimited money in college sports. No, there isn't. And at some point with an increase in the arms race, for NIL, something's got to get cut. It's not just all an unlimited trough of money. And I think what's going to get siphoned off are the non-revenue sports. And I feel for non-revenue sports. It has it's happened somewhat lately. I got a school called St. Francis that just shut down its athletics. And you'll see some minor sports get cut, but I think this could be a ramification that lasts way down the line in a much bigger sphere. So I guess my point is we're watching March Madness now and I'm watching it with an eye about NIL. NIL is increasing and good for the players. I don't know if it's good for college sports. I understand I'm pro player. I I think it's great. They get that. Do I think this is going to help college sports? No. I think it's going to help maybe players in college sports, especially in Power 5 football, especially in big-time college basketball. But will it help college sports? No, money's being siphoned away from athletic departments to pay for these players. Money's being siphoned away from sponsorships where the the, the sponsor, the vendor will just say, I'd rather have the athlete shout me out on Instagram than deal with a sign in your stadium. You know, these are the decisions that are going to be made. So that's my little rant about college sports to this week. I think it's great. You know, I've become a diehard on the bandwagon, Villanova women's basketball. They've hit the uh, perfect storm where the men didn't make the tournament this year. And here they are, home games. I went to both of them last week. 
They rolled into the Sweet 16. They play tomorrow. Speaking of NIL, they play the Cavender Twins at University of Miami. And I'll be rooting hard for Villanova women's basketball because, you know, you have a rooting interest. You know these girls. You see them around campus. It's like, okay, yeah, I'm in. I'm in. So I'm watching the women's games as much or probably more than the men's games. Okay, let's get into the NFL. The business of sports in the NFL is bigger than ever right now. One thing that's the biggest deal that's going to happen in the next few weeks is that for the face of the NFL, Roger Goodell. Reports are that a contract extension is in the works. It may be signed off and approved and signed, sealed, and delivered even. At the owners' meetings next week, where all the owners gather, there'll be a one per session. That means one person per team per session at Tuesday afternoon. And that's when they'll likely approve what the compensation committee has already come up with, which is pick a number, 30, 40, 50, 60 million dollars a year for Roger Goodell. There'll be a lot of incentives in there. But the first thing I say is uh, he has had criticism from fans, certainly from media. I've been part of that at, at points. But he really has impressed and is the favorite of the people that matter. The only ones that really matter are the owners, his constituency, the people that pay his bill, the people that fire and hire commissioners, the people that pay commissioners as they want to do next week with a huge extension for Roger Goodell. He's made them money. He's done extremely well in the metrics. What are the metrics? Well, number one, they have a team-friendly, owner-friendly, collective bargaining agreement, the second one in a row over 10 years with the players. That's extraordinary labor peace at a great price. You got to love them for that if you're the owners. Number two, he has shepherded these TV deals. It is record media for the next 11 years, I believe, between Amazon, Fox, CBS, ESPN, NBC to the tune of $110 billion. And then, of course, you have the franchise values, which are skyrocketing. The most recent $4.6 billion for the Denver Broncos. We may see the commanders go for six, six, five, seven billion dollars. Every owner will be smiling ear to ear at that number, as will Commissioner Goodell. So he's led this incredible prosperity since taking over. I was in the league when he took over in 2006. One of his more important points used to be, probably still is, first class conduct, personal conduct policy. But he seems to have become a real business commissioner. And maybe he's that because he's the only major commissioner that's not a lawyer. He's a business person that came to the NFL like in 1982, became commissioner 24 years later in 1906, and has been in that job since 2006. So that's what, 17 years. So we have a lifer as commissioner. Roger Goodell is clearly a lifer. Is anyone going to argue with him being extended as commissioner? No. Are people going to make fun or make light or make a big deal of whatever the number is going to be, whether it's 40, 50, 60 million? But, but there are always going to be rationalizations for that. My question is, what's the priority? If I was going to ask the owners and ask the commissioner, Roger Goodell, what's your priority now? Because I just mentioned it. The two major deals are done. Media is done till 2031 or 2032 or 2033, right? CBA, collective bargaining agreement, agreement with the players, a labor deal, done until what? 2020, 2031. So what's your priority? Is it globalization where basketball and soccer have the hold on the rest of the world? Unlike here, which NFL has the hold on? Is it is it tech? What are we doing? Obviously, they've got to make a deal for direct TV and, and streaming has to be among his priorities. Is it AI? What is it? You know, what is going to be the priority here? And that's what we're going to find out. Because again, Roger Goodell is set. He had labor deal set, CBA set, franchise values skyrocketing, no end in sight. So what's going to be the priority? That's what I think about when I think about Goodell. Okay. I want to get to another rant before we get to the Aaron Rodgers trade issue. But first, a word from Harry's. Harry's is the razor I use. It's smooth. It's comfortable. I never have cuts, ever. 
Every time I use it, I get a smooth, comfortable shave. I love the style and I love the smell. It's always good. I've got this set where I don't have to worry about razors costing a lot. They're sharp. They're made in their own factory. It's not integrated with other factories. You get a quality razor you can depend on delivered straight to your door from Harry's. Uh, it's got the highest customer satisfaction in the shaving industry. And I'm, I'm part of that. Again, I use it every day. I like the look, the packaging. I like how I don't have cuts. I don't have ingrown hairs. Everything's smooth. And again, the fragrance is really nice. It's uh, it's masculine, but it's it's nice. So I want you to get it. So get to Harry's. Don't get overcharged for razors. Get Harry's. You get a $15 Truman Shave Trial Set. Now, that Truman Shave Trial Set, that's got a five-blade and German-engineered razor, weighted handle, foaming shave gel, travel cover. You get all that for $15, a $15 value for $3. So again, get a $15 Truman Shave Trial Set for just $3 when you sign up. Use harrys.com slash BOS. That's my code, BOS for Business of Sports. harrys.com slash BOS. Get that $3 value on a $15 Truman Shave Set. You got it. All right, let's get back to uh, a, a football issue. I want to just clarify because this is the week that NFL teams are at the top of the draft are going around to see these quarterbacks. So yesterday, I'm talking to you on Thursday, Wednesday, CJ Stroud, Ohio State. Today, Bryce Young, Alabama. Tomorrow, Will Levy's Kentucky, presumed to be the three top quarterbacks in the draft. And of course, teams like Carolina and Houston and Las Vegas and others are Attending these workouts, they did it nice for the NFL teams where they line it up back, back, back in the similar region of the country. So that's easy to see and easy to compare the three. I would hope to think that the Carolina Panthers know who they're taking. I think it's C.J. Stroud by all the love they were showing him on video yesterday, but who knows. But for them to trade up and not know, that seems a lot. I think they know. What I found interesting yesterday was a report that Marvin Harrison worked out at Ohio State, 6'4", smooth, fast, incredible receiver in college. He can't come out of college. He can't declare for the NFL draft. He's two years out. The rule requires three years removed from eligible, three, three years removed from high school to have NFL eligibility. Marvin Harrison, who worked at Ohio State, does not have that. He has two years removed from high school. He will need another year to enter the draft. And the reason I point this out is I think it's unfair. It was unfair to another Ohio State player that tra that challenged it in the draft named Maurice Claret, who I teach in my sports law class. Maurice Claret, of course, won in lower court, but lost in the second court of appeals when Judge Sonia Sotomayor, among others, ruled for the NFL that it was part of the collective bargaining agreement and therefore Claret couldn't go into the draft. Claret was a running back. Uh, running backs are especially disadvantaged by this rule. They have their most productive years early in their career. And if they could have gotten paid for those years, it would have made a big difference in their wealth going forward. Now you get Marvin Harrison. Clearly, he's able to play in the NFL, but he can't. The reasoning behind this rule, well, first, let me say this. The rule is not an NCA rule. It's not an Ohio State rule. Okay, let's get that straight. This rule has nothing to do with college football. This rule is an NFL eligibility rule collectively bargained with the union. So it is the NFL owners and the union, the players, deciding that we're going to require three years of removal from high school, whether college or do something else, to get into the NFL. Why are they doing that? Well, one reason is who cares about them? Owners don't care about college players. And veteran players negotiating the CBA, they don't care about college players. In fact, those players are coming for their jobs. So it's interesting that in any collective bargaining agreement, you have these massive issues about revenue split, about franchise tag, about commissioner discipline, about minimum salary benefits and all that. The one issue that's never hard for these owners and players in all sports, NBA, Major League Baseball, is the rookies, the entering player pool. You just slash them. And for lack of a better word, you just screw them, right? And who's especially disadvantaged are top-level players 
I mean, we talk about rookie contract players that get so much value, teams get so much value out of them. Well, <laughs> college football gets so much value out of these players like Marvin Harrison that should be in the NFL, but for this crazy rule. Think about it. The NBA has got a one and done rule that'll probably go back to the way it was with LeBron and Kobe, a none and done rule. Baseball, you can come out as a junior, easy, right? Hockey, junior hockey, but football requires this three years. And the best explanation, not the best, its I don't think it's a good explanation, but the explanation I heard when I posed this to Gene Upshaw, the former head of the NFLPA, who used to come to Green Bay every year and do his visits, so we would sit down and have lunch. And he would say, hey, Andrew, can you imagine a 19-year-old, 20-year-old running into Ray Lewis? Can you imagine that? And at the time, I'm like, yeah, I guess, you know, but I really thought, yeah, there's some. There's some that could. Maurice Claret could have. Marvin Harrison can. And there's plenty of others that I don't know about, that names don't, uh, you know, that aren't as big names. But this is the reasoning. So when I look at Marvin Harrison, you never know what will happen in, in life and sports. And he's giving up a year, probably two years, maybe three years of solid million millions of dollars pay because of this rule. And again, the rule is not an NCAA rule. The rule is a college. I'm sorry. The rule is a NFL rule, collectively bargained, negotiated and approved by the Players Association. So again, I, I, this is an exam question, a multiple choice. The NFL three-year, I'm sorry, the three-year eligibility rule for college football players is A, a college rule, B, an NCAA rule, C, an Ohio State rule, D, an NFL rule. There you go, D. Um, listen, I'm always, I'm pro player on some things, I'm pro management on some things, but that one to me is why. Why should, if, if he really is the best receiver in the country, not be able to go pro? Certainly the best chemist in the country could, the best engineer, the best computer coder, the best fla uh, flautist, the best, uh, you know, whatever, creative writer. They can all go pro. They can start making money. But I know there's NAL, but come on. You know, this rule is like, are you serious? Three years for for college football players that you don't think they could run into big linebackers when they're younger than that? Okay. Just my thoughts there. Okay. Before we get to the uh, Jets Packers, uh, just a quick word from Labatt's. You know, a lot of things are better together. Hockey, food, golf, of course, hockey, Labatt's. If you really want to take things to the next level, drink some Labatt Blue Lights with your friends and live life to the power of we. Always enjoy responsibly beer, Labatt USA, Buffalo, New York. Speaking of New York, here I go. The Jets and Packers are going to trade Aaron Rodgers, we think, between them. We don't have compensation. So we're about 10 days removed from Aaron Rodgers going on Pat McAfee and saying, among other things, my intention is to play for the New York Jets. Uh, and then he made a comment, but they, the Packers, are digging in their heels. My sense is these trade negotiations have been going on for some time, and now they are no good negotiations. They're crickets. They're silence. Neither side is speaking to each other. Basically, you have a situation where Aaron is no longer desired by the Green Bay Packers. I've talked to Ad Infinitum about that and the eerie deja vu between what's happening now and what happened 15 years ago. Okay. He is told basically to move on by the Packers. They're moving to Jordan Love. This is the pivot point. Let's first talk about the contract. The contract has, we don't need to get into all the parts of the contract. The key is Aaron's going to make 60 million this year unless he retires. It's 59 something for ease. We'll call it 60 million. The 60 million is mostly in the form of an option bonus. There's a small salary, the minimum salary, but it's mainly an option bonus. The option bonus has an ability to be exercised by the Packers or a team it's traded to up until the start of the season. If it's not, it becomes salary. And then, of course, you have a $60 million charge on your salary cap. If it is exercised, 
it becomes proratable over the future years and there'll be void years added to make it proratable a long period of time. And the cap number goes down to roughly 16 million this year, which is what the Jets will do if and when they acquire the contract, exercise the option, and now you take on 16 million instead of 60. Now, that contract is a surprise to me because with all the leverage that Aaron had, he is dealing with a with a contract without a decision point in 2023. In other words, the Packers have no urgency to make a decision. They owe no money to Aaron Rodgers until September. Think about that. One of the best players in the league, one of the best contracts in the league, but there's no early money. There's no early roster bonus, right? There's no early exercise on the option. They have until, as we talked about, September. This gives the Packers extraordinary leverage. And I wonder why Aaron Rodgers and his people, with all this leverage, would not require an early decision point in 2023, by the, where the Packers had to decide before paying Rodgers a huge roster bonus in March, five, 10, 15 million dollars, or have to exercise the option in March, not in September, in March. For whatever reason, that's not in it. And maybe the Packers knew they would be trading Aaron Rodgers in 2023, or at least have the option to. And somehow Rodgers people thought, we're getting the 60 million. So I guess it doesn't matter. Well, it does matter because there's a trade on the table and the trade is not going to be consummated because there's no urgency. There's no deadline. There's no early payment. The first money Rodgers receives from the Packers, if it's the Packers, is September. Okay, that is another factor why I have const constantly and consistently stated since Aaron went on McAfee that the Packers have the upper hand here. In the leverage discussions, leverage is defined by me as this. Leverage belongs to the party in the negotiation that is most satisfied with the status quo. The status quo of the Packers is they don't know owe oh, Aaron a dime until September. They have no issue at quarterback. They have their quarterback on the roster who's been sitting there for three years. Where's the urgency? <laughs> they have none. The status quo for the Jets is they have no quarterback. They went to California their head coach, their owner, their owner's brother, their offensive coordinator, their salary cap person, their general manager. They kissed the ring. They begged Aaron Rodgers to play for them, and they flew back. <laughs> okay. They have a fan base frothing at the mouth to get Aaron Rodgers. Compare those status quos. Again, Packers, no money owed to Aaron Rodgers till September, have their quarterback on their roster. Jets, no quarterback, right? Zach Wilson, don't even tell me, no quarterback. Flew out to kiss the ring of Rodgers, begged him. Fan base, frothing at the mouth. Okay. Now, Joe Douglas is not an easy mark, the general manager of the, of the Jets, so he's sitting and waiting. But what does waiting do? Well, waiting is no problem for the Packers. At this point, there's no problem for the Packers. Now, does the leverage equation change as we get to the draft? Potentially, because the Packers want a 2023 pick and they don't want the pick to go past uh, the draft. They don't want the trade negotiations to go past the draft. But if they have to settle for all 2024 picks, they do. It's some urgency for the Packers, but it's not diabolical. Okay, then if they get past the draft, complete leverage back to the Packers again, right? Because there's no deadline. Again, we're going into training camp now. The Packers have to keep them. Listen, here's some of the arguments. I've, I've, people out there are trying to make these arguments that the Jets have leverage. I don't get it because I don't see any reality to these arguments. The argument they make is, well, Aaron Rodgers is going to show up and want to work out. And he could get hurt. Okay. Please, please. <laughs> the idea that Aaron Rodgers is going to leave Southern California to go up to off-season workouts where he's not wanted 
and work out in the Packers weight room in chilly, cold Green Bay, Wisconsin, in the middle of April or whatever it is, please. Okay, please, come on. The other thing is, well, uh, they're going to be stuck with Aaron Rodgers' $60 million if they don't trade him. Well, of course. But that's September. People, that's September. First of all, people are saying that, well, uh, do they really think this is going to go to September? Do they think the pack, the Jets are going to go to training camp without Aaron Rodgers? Really? And then I hear people say, well, Rodgers, of course, he can miss workouts. He can miss training camp. They'll just show up at the Jets. These are the same people that said, hey, Rodgers missed all that time with the young receivers of the Packers, caused them to have a bad year. Yeah, I'm on. you can't go both ways here. OK, so many said, well, Rodgers didn't show up last year, didn't work with those receivers. Come on. And now they're saying he could just show up week one with the Jets. Listen, I respect people that have different opinions, but I'm I, I keep looking at this and I'm like, where is the leverage for the Jets? Maybe for two days in April, they have leverage of the 23 draft, but it gets past 23 draft. OK, the Packers push harder on 24. And players. So I'm just not seeing it. Because at the end of the day, do you envision anything like this? Joe Douglas going to his owner, his team, his offensive coordinator handpicked for Aaron Rodgers, his receiver group handpicked for Aaron Rodgers, that includes now Alan Lazard, maybe more, and his fan base. Do you picture Joe Douglas, the general manager of the New York Jets, going to his owner, his coach, his OC, his fan base, his receiver group, and saying, hey, guys, they asked for too much. We're going to pass on Rodgers. Neither do I. <laughs> As you answer that, neither do I. And that's really the bottom line here. Now, listen. I don't expect multiple first round picks for Aaron Rodgers. I don't. What I am saying is that whatever the Jets are offering and have been offering, it may have already gone up and it's going to keep going up before a deal is made because the Packers have leverage. What is the deal going to be? Well, the easy part of the deal is the 24 pick, which will go from a fourth to a third to a second, maybe a first, based on Aaron's performance, statistically, based on playoffs, based on his playtime, all kinds of ways to do that. Maybe it only goes fourth, third, second. Maybe it goes third, second, first. That's the easy part of the trade. And another potentially easy part of the trade is a pick in 25 if Aaron plays in 24 a certain playtime because we don't know. And that 25 can be a stair-step pick in the 25 draft. The hard part is what comes back in 23. Now, the Jets acquired another second-round pick yesterday. Now they have two back-to-back, -back, 42 and 43. Could those two seconds be enough to get Aaron this year? Maybe. Are they worth more than the, the first-round pick? I don't know. I just think whatever's being offered, they're going to go up. And again, I'm not here saying they're going to get a Russell Wilson-type deal, two ones, two twos, anything like that, because Aaron's older and because you don't know how long he's going to play, et cetera. But – Come on. Who has leverage in this situation? I think it's pretty clear. And once again, I'll listen to anything. When I negotiate, when I argue, when I debate, if you got a good argument, great, but I don't see it with the Jets. What's the argument? That Aaron's going to show up in Green Bay? No. That Aaron's going to show up in Green Bay in September or a training camp? Come on. And if it's not done by then, the Jets are cool not having a quarterback? Come on. Okay. That'll do it, guys. That's my uh, Brant's rant about the trade. I've written about it. I've podcasted. Now I've podcasted about it. It's all over Twitter. You can follow me. If you disagree, fine. We can be friends. But I don't see the Jets having any leverage here. All right. Newsletter, andrew-brant.com. I'm writing about this all the time. Good stuff this coming week. andrew-brant.com if you're not getting it. My reels, I do the these... Quick videos every day, Andrew Brandt too on Instagram, Andrew Brandt on Twitter. Of course, um, listen to this podcast and give us a great good rating and, and comments if you would. I really appreciate that. Share with a friend. 
all the comments mean a lot to us and the ratings as we try to move forward with this. Um, and of course, ask questions you want answered on the podcast anytime. Hope you have a great week. I'll be back next week. Thanks to Jack Connell, my producer, musical producer, Sam Brandt, who you hear under us. And of course, thanks to you, our listeners. Be back next week with another edition of the Business of Sports with Andrew Brandt.